What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, H-A-W-G sports.com. Well, Arkansas headed down to Tuscaloosa to face the number 11 ranked Alabama Crimson Tide. Is this an Alabama team that could be had in Tuscaloosa? I don't know if Arkansas has got the team to do it. Haven't won down there in a long time. 15 straight losses to Alabama. Last win was in 2006. So, we're still going to take a deep dive into it. We're still going to dissect the game. Arkansas is big underdogs in this one, but they're still making the trip to Tuscaloosa. They're going to play a football game. It's not played on paper. We're going to check in with Cody Goodwin over at Bama 24-7, help us get a little bit more insight on the Crimson Tide, and also we're going to check in with Curtis Wilkerson, get a little bit more Arkansas perspective, and maybe talk a little bit of basketball as well. This is your Arkansas versus Alabama primer. So many ways to watch and listen. You can always tune in on Facebook Live. Follow the page if you haven't done so already. And give us a thumbs up on this video if you're enjoying it. Also available on YouTube. Take a moment and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so. Certainly hit the notifications bell so you're alerted anytime we upload new videos. Most people that watch the show aren't even subscribed to the channel on YouTube. So take a moment and do that. Also, love to have that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We are approaching 1,000 reviews so far, or ratings, I should say. So even if you don't want to leave a review, which we'd love to have, have take us a moment take a moment and give us that five star rating also available on spotify love to have a five star from you there google podcast and everywhere you can think of to find podcasts we are there at h-a-w-g sports.com hog sports is just one dollar right now for your first month at h-a-w-g sports part of the part of the 24 7 sports network a lot of people probably don't even know that we also have a website i know i talk about it sometimes but we do have a website and uh, that is really our bread and butter the whole reason we do this show is to promote the website. So go check us out at hogsports.com. A lot of the content is free, and you can certainly enjoy that. For more casual fans, the more diehard, probably going to want the VIP subscription. Again, just $1 for your first month. Where to start? Arkansas football schedule. Well, let's talk about – let's talk a little bit basketball. Let's get a few ins and outs. So, Arkansas obviously played the Red-White Showcase on October 4th. We're obviously going to talk to Curtis a little bit more about basketball, but it's still a little bit of ways out, eight days until they play UT Tyler in the ex- exhibition game at Bud Walton Arena. I don't believe there's any TV for that one at 630. Uh, but they do play Purdue in the charity ex- exhibition on Saturday, October 28th. Again, eight days later from that. And that is on SEC Network Plus. So you will be able to watch that. That's at 3 o'clock. Of course, I'll have plenty of information on how to watch that for those of you who get confused by the SEC Network Plus. So... Injury report for Arkansas. I mean, they've got some guys banged up. It feels pretty good that Cam Ball's going to be able to play. Now, they've been a little dinged up on the defensive line, but it's kind of the stuff we talked about, you know, in the preseason that they have such good depth up front on the defensive line that they're able to absorb it a little bit better. And Arkansas has been pretty solid defensive line. I mean, uh, you know, they're not giving up the huge numbers in the rushing department they gave up last year. They're not they're they're not making as many sacks, but they're not also not giving up as many you know explosive plays. But they are still making a good number of sacks and getting some good TFLs. Also ranked pretty highly in the SEC and TFLs. But they have been banged up a little bit on the defensive line. Jashad Stewart obviously missed some time. He's been back. Uh, Cam Ball was banged up against Ole Miss. Uh, John Morgan had that scary neck injury against uh, against Texas A and M and didn't play last week. But looks like Morgan's gonna be back. Stewart's obviously been back. Looks like Cam Ball is going to be able to be back. I mean, he was on – they usually don't take injured players up to the podium, and he was, you know, he was there for uh, Sam Pittman Live on Wednesday. So, uh, that's a good sign that he'll be able to play. So, it looks like they'll be a little bit healthier there. Don't know on Al Walcott. Looks unlikely on Chris Paul. Don't know on Jalen Braxton. Looks probable on Dwight McLaughlin. I would expect them – you know, the Chris Paul one could hurt them a good bit. You know, I think that they'll – even if they don't have Walcott or Braxton, that would stink, but it would be – they can absorb it a little bit better than – against a team like Alabama, you need linebackers rotating in. And they use a lot of 12 personnel, which is two tight ends, one running back. And in that case, if you see a lot of that, then maybe a 4-3 would make a lot of sense for Arkansas with three linebackers out there. And if you don't have Chris Paul, then you're talking – you know, you're talking – one man down who, you know, arguably your best or second best linebacker. 
Um, you still have Jaheim Thomas there. Antonio Greer would likely play a good bit. Brad Spence, Jordan Crook, you'd probably get some kind of rotation with those guys if Paul can't play. But if he does have a concussion, which they haven't said that, but if that's what the injury is, then it seems unlikely that he would play the next week. But it looks good on Nudie. You know, if you think about it, too, you know, they had Braxton banged up. Braxton didn't play the second half against Ole Miss. McLaughlin didn't play at all. And those are two of your better secondary players, and they still held Ole Miss to, what, like 168 passing yards? Like 16 and 25. That's pretty good. You know, Alabama isn't like the Alabama that we've seen. This is a 19-and-a-half point game. Betting, betting line, Arkansas is plus 19 and a half. So they're the uh, pretty significant, uh, excuse me, pretty significant underdog. And uh, that hasn't changed at all. It's, that was the line when we talked on Monday. Uh, plus 750 if you're feeling froggy and want to bet Arkansas on the money line. This is all according to the Bet Saracen app. Um, 46 and a half is the over under. So to me, that does that mean they're like expecting like a 31 14 type of game or something? So not exceedingly high scoring especially on Arkansas' side, but that would be, you know, what, 17 points. So not expecting a huge scoring game in this one by either team, really, but especially, I guess that would mean, especially for Arkansas. When you look at Alabama's schedule, they got Tennessee next. That's always a big game. Tennessee got them last year. Game's in Tuscaloosa. Could they be overlooking Arkansas a little bit? I'll tell you what, what Arkansas needs to happen. They need Alabama to overlook them and look ahead to Tennessee. They need to ingest a lot of rat poison, as Nick Saban says. A lot of rat poison this week. Um, they need to have some ball bounce, balls bounce against them. Balls bounce Arkansas's favor. Turnovers need to happen. Uh, you know, it's not like Al- Alabama's not producing a ton of offense this year. Now, they played a pretty tough schedule the first half of the season. But they're not producing just like a ton of offense. Not a, not a bunch on the ground. Uh, obviously not a bunch through the air. They've had some quarterback issues here and there. They are still winning, <laughs> and they're winning close games, which is what Arkansas hasn't been able to do so far this season. That's where Arkansas has struggled. Arkansas has had a tough road, too. They've played three straight road games, counting Texas A&M, which is a split crowd, but it's away from home. You know, you guys know what I mean. Uh, and this is the fourth straight game away from home when they face Alabama and Tuscaloosa. That BYU game sure does loom large. Now, BYU's playing pretty well overall but still you got to get that game at home you know we've had a lot of people talking about like what is what is it going to take like for Arkansas to make a change because there's you know there's the pitchfork crowd out there there's also the crowd that's like it's not looking good and there's the crowd that remembers you know what Sam Pittman did for Arkansas pulling them out of the ditch the situation that they were in in 2019 2018 2019 under Chad Morris and you know back then everybody was talking like culture fit Perfect fit for Arkansas. Other teams are going to motivate. Other teams are going to base and model their program after what Arkansas has done. Going out and not necessarily getting some flashy coordinator, but a guy that's you know managed teams, guys that've been in the business, guys that fits their culture, and that's been a big talk you see across college football. You know, a lot of other teams kind of did that same thing. Dabo Sweeney at, at Clemson is probably the ace example of a culture fit kind of guy. Um, Shane Beamer at South Carolina was a guy that was hired kind of based on those same principles. So a lot of people remember that kind of stuff. And there's been some talk like what, you know, what's the number? And there's I know there's fans that are completely furious and fed up, and I get it. I Trust me, I do. I totally get it. Um, I also know that football is short. It's a short season. They put in a lot of work, and it's a short season. Not a lot of games fewer than any other major sport. Um, and it's important to enjoy football season. It just is. And you can be frustrated and mad and stuff. I get it. But, like, if you really love football, think about how excited and amped up you were for the start of the season. And because it hasn't gone the way anybody really expected, you know, you just throw your hands up. And you, you know, you're going to stop watching. You don't care. Apathy sets in. I get that. I get that mindset, too. I just try to remind myself when I start feeling like that, that, like, we don't get a lot of football. It sucks, but – we don't get a lot of football. The second half of the season, you know, looks more manageable. But there's been a lot of people talking like, what would, what would it, what would have to happen if Sam, you know, for Sam Pittman to lose his job? The thing that jumps out to me when I look at it is, you know, they've lost, they've lost these games, right? They lost to BYU by seven. They lost to LSU by three. You know, the only game they lost to Ole Miss by seven, all on the road, except for BYU. That was at home. Uh, the Texas A&M game is the one game where they 
clearly looked outmatched to me. Like I look at LSU and I'm like, the thing that's frustrating is like mistakes, penalties, just you know, turnovers, things like that that cost them that game. Uh, Ole Miss, kind of the same same deal. BYU, we know penalties played a huge role in that game. Them losing that one. I also think there were some poorly called plays. Uh, Texas A&M is the only game where you'd say, yeah, they just definitely got outmatched. They also only lost by 12 points in the game. <laughs> I mean, the defense has played well to me all season except for the second half against LSU. Certainly a sight better than what they did last year. And I'll, I'll say this, the difference for me with Sam Pittman, and nobody likes losing close games, especially when you've won you know, one out of the last seven close games, and that was the Liberty Bowl. And what is he, 5-12 and 12 overall in, in one-score games? And this by that I mean like you know seven points or less. But it's not like they're just getting smoked, you know, and the team hasn't, like, let go of the rope. And a lot of people think, that like, media's job is, like, call out coach and say somebody needs to be fired, and that's not true. Um, you know, my job is just call it like I see it, and, you know, the fans ultimately and the administration decide whether or not somebody gets fired. The only time I've ever done that, like, been, like, pretty adamant that somebody needs to go is with Pelfrey in basketball and with Morse in football. And that was just because the team – had quit on them. They didn't, you know, they hated their coach and they weren't winning. You know, it was just like, and they were just getting smoked and losing game, just like getting obliterated. You know, nobody likes losing. Nobody likes losing close games. At the same time, we're talking about a seven point loss, a three point loss, a seven point loss, and a 12 point loss to, I think, a really good Texas AM team, even though they lost to Alabama last weekend in a close game. And I'm not making excuses for anybody. And I'm not saying I'm not disappointed in the way this season has gone. I am. But I know also that when you're in something, it feels a lot different than when you're looking ahead and projecting. Now, who knows how this season ends up. I don't think they're going to Alabama and winning. I think they're probably going to get beaten pretty soundly. The next five weeks, not including the bye, Mississippi State, winnable. A bye week. And then you're at Florida. Okay, that's not the floor. That's this is going to be the worst Florida team that Arkansas has played in Gainesville to this point. I'm not saying they're going to beat them, but I'm just saying that's the case. Auburn, which is you know not setting the world on fire, Auburn can definitely get them. I'm not saying that, but it's a more manageable game. It's at home, FIU, and then a Missouri team that's playing well, but is also gettable. They can also get that one. And I just know that when you're in the game, when you're in a part of the season, it feels a lot different than when you're on the outside. I mean, think about like when you're projecting Arkansas's win total this season. A lot of people said seven, eight. Some people said nine. I said eight personally. And when you're projecting, you're like, okay, this is an acceptable number for this team. And maybe if some balls bounce their way, yada, yada. But when you're in it and they lose game, it's just unbelievable. It's unacceptable. You're furious. You're mad. You're throwing your remote through your TV. I've only done that one time. It was on accident. I threw it down on the ottoman and it bounced off and just went right into the television i did not intentionally rage out and throw it through my television but it did happen that was after western kentucky game by the way so anyway that's just some of my thoughts on it you know it's it's not like the team is quitting and, and we had a really good thread on it it's like what's your number like for number of losses and stuff. And, uh, you know, I thought one of the interesting ones somebody brought up is like, you know, they didn't quit on Brett Bielema, but, you know, they didn't quit on Brett Bielema, but they uh, he still got fired. Well, Brett Bielema was in year five. Brett Bielema had other issues besides just the football, you know. Um, but they also went four and eight in year five, and that hasn't happened to Pittman yet. There's still a lot of games left. Um, they also – got waxed that year in 2017 by TCU. And by wax, I mean not like losing by three or seven or something. And, again, you know, that's an indictment too. Like one in six in your last seven games by one score, that's not a good number. But TCU, South Carolina, Alabama, Auburn, and LSU all in 2017 just smoked Arkansas. They just smoked them. Now, they battled back in some games. They battled back against Ole Miss. They battled back against Coastal Carolina when they could have just given up and quit, and they didn't. And that, to me, said that they hadn't quit on Brett. They just they didn't have a good team. 
The year before, they were hammered by Texas A&M, Alabama, Auburn, and LSU before blowing massive halftime leads against Missouri and Virginia Tech and losing those games. And I also remember, you know, they fired Brett and they hired Chad Morris. That was the hire. That was – that like, and I know things are differently now. And you got Hunter Yurchek, and you don't have, you know, the committee and the, you know, stand-in athletic director and stuff like that. But what I also remember about Hunter is when he took over and he made his first hire, the only guys that we could find that wanted the job were Barry Lunny Jr., Deion Sanders, and Sam Pittman. Now Sanders, yeah, looking back, you're like, oh, that would have been awesome. But Sanders had zero head coaching experience. He wasn't even at Jackson State then. Lunny had zero head coaching experience and was the interim coach. And Sam Pittman had zero head coaching experience. That was the situation Arkansas was in after firing Chad. And then Chad was the only option they had after firing Brett. Now, Brett was actually viewed as the biggest hire. He was a big-time hire for Arkansas at the time. Anyway, just a few thoughts, trying to put things in perspective a little bit. I'm not trying to tell you how to think or whether or not Sam Pittman should be fired or shouldn't be fired. I'm just putting it in perspective for me, and I get as mad as anybody. You know, I'm passionate about it. You know, I, I follow this team, obviously. I've followed him my whole life. I've followed him professionally for 20 years. It gets frustrating to me, too. Just trying to put things in perspective a little bit. I know that there are different segments out there. There's the pitchfork group. There's the group that's wait and see. And there's the group that remembers, um, you know, what Sam Pittman did initially when he was hired. And there's and I think everybody, even the pitchfork crowd, likes Sam and have been pulling for him. I see a few comments here and there that's like, I hope they lose so they'll fire him, which I think is ridiculous. I mean, I, I n- never think that's a good avenue to go. But um, what is your number? Leave them in the comments below. I'll tell you a good number to call, and that is 479-684-4900. And you can reach our friends at Ozarks Go. If you're disappointed in the internet service you have right now or you don't have internet, check out ozarksgo.net slash H-A-W-G, ozarksgo.net slash hog, and find out if they're available in your area. Think north of the tunnel. Think uh, they've got a foothold in Rogers now. Uh, They're in Fayetteville. They're in Missouri Oklahoma parts, so and they're ever expanding. So uh, check out our friends at Ozarks Go. They offer several tiers of internet. I use Multi Gig, which is their highest tier because I use a lot of internet. Obviously, I got a lot of things going on all at once, and I've never had them drop. Never dropped me one time. Two and a half years. Never. My router has never been unplugged and replugged. You know, you had to do that. You had to do, like, what's wrong with the internet? Dad, go do the router thing. Never had to do that one time. Two and a half years, and I'm on the internet constantly constantly go check out our friends at ozarks go trey biddy stamp of approval ozarksgo.net slash h-a-w-g all right i want to get to cody goodwin cody goodwin is a fairly new cover in the alabama site but does a great job he also has podcasts and a number of other things you can reach him on twitter at cody goodwin pretty simple joined joined early 2009 so he got the full name See what Cody has to say about this matchup on Saturday. Hello. Hey, Cody. How you doing, man? Doing great, Trey. How you doing? I'm doing good. You're on air with us at Hog Sports Live and uh, streaming right now on Facebook Live, and going to be uploaded to YouTube and plenty of other platforms later. Uh, Cody. Uh, we can just jump into it if you want to. I, I don't want to steer too far from some of the questions that I, I'd asked you, you know, earlier in the week. But um, can you just fill us in on the injury report, first of all, with Alabama? What can we expect? Who's been out? Who might be coming back? Any suspensions? Anything like that? Yeah, I think the the biggest one to keep an eye on, Malachi Moore, he plays the star position, um, kind of that, you know, safety linebacker hybrid in Alabama's defense, really crucial part too, since he does a lot of the communicating between the front seven and the secondary. Um, he left the A&M game last week with looked like an ankle injury. Um, you know, he left the game on crutches. Um, and so it sounds like Alabama has been preparing to play without him. This season, so that'll shift uh, Terry and Arnold, who's been playing corner opposite of Kool Aid McKinstry. Um, that'll shift him to star and bring in uh, Trey Amos, transfer from this offseason. 
off the bench to play corner. Um, so they're preparing like he's not going to play. But I think Saban said on uh, the SEC teleconference on Wednesday that uh, Malachi will be a game time decision. So he's he's kind of the big one. They've got a few other small nicks and bruises. I know their their punter James Burnip um, mm-hmm. also left the A and M game with an injury. So it sounds like he's a game time decision too. But um, kicker Will Reichard will uh, likely fill in the punting duties there. He did it um, against A&M last week, um, did it pretty well too. Um, so, but yeah, Malachi Moore is really, he's the big one just because of kind of, you know, the position he plays obviously and just, you know, everything that he does for Alabama's defense. Again, Cody Goodwin joining us. You can follow him at Cody Goodwin. He's a staff writer over at Bama 24-7 and has done a good job. Go check out his stuff. If you're an Alabama fan listening or if you're a curious Arkansas fan, Alabama quarterback situation has been interesting. I mean, like the last five starters have all been, you know, good enough to leave to lead Alabama to the national championship or the college football playoff. What do we see out of out of Jalen Milrow, just his journey this season, being benched for a little bit, coming back? Uh, what kind of quarterback is he, and and how much how has he improved as the year has gone on? Yeah, he's he's improved a lot as the year has gone on. He's one of those guys where just with more reps, he gets a little bit more comfortable. The game slows down a little bit for him. Um, you know, so he's, he's really, he's really good when it, you know, those quick one read passes, he's really excellent when it comes to, you know, just the short passing situations. He's also been tremendous when it comes to deep passing this season. That was really one of the biggest questions we had about him coming into this season. Just, you know, can you hit the deep throw? Can you keep the defenses honest? Um, you know, cause he just, he wasn't very good at that last year in the couple of, you know, you know, garbage time uh, mm-hmm. opportunities that we got to see him. And, and this year he's been fantastic on deep passes, you know, deep passes, um, you know, balls that go 20 plus yards down the field. He is 15 of 23, 560 yards, seven touchdowns, no picks. Um, you know, latest performance came against A&M where I believe he went six of eight on downfield passes, 200 yards, two touchdowns. Like he's just, you know, he's, he's been really, really good. He's been very accurate with the ball. He's, he's for the most part taken care of the ball. I think that was another question we had about him coming in. Cause you know, he started one game for Bryce young last season against Texas A&M who, you know, pretty talented roster over there, but you know, he threw three touchdowns also uh, turned the ball over three times. And that made last year's game a lot closer than it was this year mostly taking care of the ball. He threw two picks against Texas, um, and then he's had a pick each of the last uh, – two of the last three weeks, I guess, one against Ole Miss and then another one against A&M last week. But, you know, no fumbles. Um, you know, hasn't really had a lot of turnover-worthy um, plays. He's really gotten two hands on the ball when he decides to tuck it and run it, and, you know, he's insanely fast too. So that's mm. that's another thing that Alabama's tried to do offensively, lean into the fact that, you know, he can run the ball, that he, when he tucks it and runs it, he's – you know, more often than not, one of the fastest guys on the field, you know, no matter what game he plays in this season. So, um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's been good. Um, I, you know, I think the jury's still out on whether, you know, he can take Alabama all the way. But, um, you know, for what they want to do or at least what they, the offense has become for Alabama this season, he is, he's been playing really well. Um, you know, and he, you know, as long as he takes care of the ball and just, you know, I, I think Saban more, more wants a point guard at uh, his quarterback position than he maybe wants a shooting guard. So, you know, just distribute, mm-hmm. take care of the ball. Um, you know, a, a game with 13 assists and, you know, not a lot of points is still a pretty good game if, if those assists leads to points by the other guys on the team, right? So yeah, um, that's kind of what Saban wants. And, and you know, through, you know, five games this season, he's played five games. He didn't play uh, against South Florida in week three. Um, you know, Milrose more or less kind of played that role so far this season. Yeah. Alabama got a big offensive line, probably the biggest – offensive line that Arkansas will face this year two tackles that go 360 but they they have given up a good number of tackles for loss and sacks what what are your what are your thoughts on that is that is that a product of maybe Milrow struggling or is it uh is it the offensive line opening up some some holes in the wrong direction (laughs) I think it's a it's a little bit of a combination right I mean this Alabama offensive line you know they talked in the fall camp about you know, we want to make people quit. We want to, you know, bring back the the nasty of, you know, the the early Saban tenure Alabama offensive lines, you know, run the ball or run the ball, um, play a little bit of bully ball, you know, kind of that joyless murder ball, right? Mm-hmm. Like run the ball, run the clock, beat you up on defense, you know, and just really control games that way. Um, offensive line hasn't really allowed them to do that. They're really, you know, they haven't run the ball very well this year. 
They're not very good as a run blocking unit. Part of that is because, you know, they've had to replace three guys from last year's offensive line. Um, you know, Emil Echior and, and Tyler Steen are now in the NFL and then um, JV on Cohen transferred to Miami. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of experience to have to replace. And, you know, they've got good players, right? Like they've got, you know, four and five star guys all the way up and down the offensive line, but they're, they're still trying to take time to gel a little bit. I think as a pass blocking unit, they have gotten better. Um, you know, I think what 26 sacks allowed, it's not a great number, right? I think only two schools in the country have allowed more sacks than Alabama this year. And, you know, Colorado and Old Dominion, I think at 31 and 32 respectively, but you know, a lot of those sacks, uh, you know, A&M did a really good job last week. They finished the game with six sacks. So it's like, okay, the offensive line played poorly. It's like, no, they, they did a lot of good stuff on like blitzes and, and, you know, pre-snap movement. Um, you know, sometimes they just kind of overwhelm the offensive line. A lot of times too, Jalen Milrow maybe steps out of pockets when he probably shouldn't. Um, you know, so that leads to opportunities for sacks and tackles for loss. Um, you know, on occasion, you know, I think early in the season, the running backs were maybe struggling a little bit with pass protection, you know, just in that role. So that led to some more tackles for loss and some sacks. So um, the whole operation has been kind of a work in progress. I think they've they've gotten a little bit better when it comes to pass protecting over the last few weeks. Um, you know, they're at least giving Milro a little bit more time or at least they're giving him the opportunity to maybe find a running lane so he can get out and, you know, create chunk plays that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this offensive line had, you know, they set really high expectations for themselves through fall camp and, um, you know, they haven't really come close to even sniffing it. Um, you know, I you, we talk about like the improvements that they may be made, you know, they're, they're kind of crawling out of the basement as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, really climbing a ladder here. So, I mean, it's, it's been good enough so far to get to five and one, but, you know, I, th I think they still need to make some pretty significant improvements if this Alabama team wants to, you know, one, get to Atlanta and two, potentially beyond there. Yeah, yeah. And, not, I mean, Alabama hasn't been like the 250-yard rushing team since really like 2018. So it's been a little while since they've kind of had that identity. A lot of veteran skill players that we're familiar with, Jermaine Burton, Jace McClellan, Roy Dell Williams, all those guys are seniors, I guess. Uh, what can you tell us a little bit about those guys real quick? They, so they have a lot of skill guys, right? Like I, everybody, you know, Jermaine Burton this past week against A&M, nine catches, almost 200 yards, two touchdowns. Isaiah Bond had a really good game, had a 52-yard touchdown reception, um, you know, and then they've got, you know, they've got other guys that can give them really productive snaps, right? Like Kobe Prentice is, is really good. Ja'Cory Brooks was one of their leading receivers last year. I think he's been dinged up a little bit and just really hasn't played a lot this season. They have a true freshman that they really like in Jalen Hale. Um, you know, you mentioned the running backs, Roy Dell Williams, Jace McClellan, two really productive guys. They have another really good running back in the stable in Justice Haynes, who's a true freshman. We haven't seen a ton of him this year. Um, you know, and then really kind of the, the emergence of the tight ends, I think, has really been um, a welcomed development for this Alabama yeah. team. I, I, I think I mentioned in the in the five questions that we traded back and forth, Amari Nyblack has been really a really talented receiving weapon for them. He, he plays tight end, but he's more of – you know, he's, he's kind of a big body receiver a little bit when you look at him. They line him up in the slot. They line him out wide. They put him in line. Um, you know, he's got nine catches, 170 yards, two touchdowns this season. Um, you know, he's a guy that can – he's got really good speed. So, yards after the catch, he can, he can really make defenses pay that way as well. Um, the problem with all of these skill guys is that there's just not a lot of snaps – to go around and there's not a lot of, you know, there's only one ball, right? There's not a lot of targets mm -hmm. um, or a lot of touches to go around for these guys. So, you know, do, do you try and force feed? I think, you know, last week against A&M, it was Burton and Bond really that, you know, took up majority of the touches um, just because that was kind of Alabama's game plan, right? To kind of drop back and, and throw the ball and see if you could protect against A&M's pass rush. And for the most part, they did the job. But, you know, you look at some of these other games, wide receiver usage has been a little bit confusing. Um, you know, Alabama, with with the addition of Tommy Rees, an offensive coordinator, have really leaned into multiple tight ends, right? So you've got, you know, Amari Nyblack and C.J. Dupre, who transferred in from Maryland. They're on the field at the same time, so got to pull a receiver off. Um, you know, so that you, and then even then, you know, do you throw it to Nye Black? Do you throw it to Dupre? Do you throw it to Burton? Do you hand it off? You know, they've done a lot of, you know, they've run the ball. They've had more success running the ball with 12 personnel. Um, you know, so it's, you know, there's a lot of skill guys, a lot of guys here that can do a lot of really good things, but there's only one ball. There's only so many spots on the field. And so it's just been, you know, a lot of inconsistency in terms of how they've used all these weapons. So it seems like, you know, there's one guy that has a big game and then the next game, there's another guy that has a big game. So, you know, it's who's, who's the guy to watch on Saturday. I'm not a hundred percent sure I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Dupre and uh, Nye Black both 
pretty good options in the passing game, averaging uh, 20.8 yards per catch and 18.9 yards per catch from the tight end position. You don't see that a whole lot. Be interesting to see if Arkansas tries to counter that with maybe a little, um, maybe putting more linebackers on the field or something like that, what they try to do exactly. What can you tell us a little bit about this defense? I mean, 22 sacks this season, good number of sacks. Um, what, 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 do we, what do we see out of this defense for Alabama? I – I, man, I, I'm, I've not been shy this week about saying that this defense is championship caliber, man. Mm-hmm. They are, they're very good against the run. Um, they are, you know, they have a very, very good secondary. You know, you got Kool Aid on one corner, you got Terry and Arnold on another. Um, you know, Malachi Moore at the star position. They have a fantastic true freshman in Caleb Downs who has really, I mean, even, you know, if you're a true freshman starting in Nick Saban's defense, you're, you're already really good. But I, over the last few weeks, he's really taken his game up a notch and has really started to shine in the defense. Um, you know, the front seven, you know, you always start with the edge rushers, right? Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell, the, you know, for my money, the, the best pass rushing duo in the country, those two guys alone have combined for, you know, 70 uh, quarterback pressures already this season. You know, I think they've also combined for 13 sacks between the two, Um, you know, and then you've got really good depth that's starting to emerge along the defensive line as well. You've got uh, big Tim Keenan in the middle. Um, He was kind of a fall camp surprise that has turned into a very, very productive player. Justin Aboigby and Jaheim Otis are out on the defensive ends. And then you've got, you know, three or four or five other guys who rotate in off the bench and give really productive snaps. There's just, there's not really a weakness on this Alabama defense, um, you know, at least through the first six weeks. Um, You know, I know Steve Sarkeesian from from Texas, he really kind of put Caleb Downs in a little bit of a pickle in week two, just, you know, that motion-based offense, finding the matchups he likes and then spamming those plays until you stop it. And, um, you know, Texas was able to pull away in the fourth quarter there. But really since then, I mean, they have – They've played really well. You know, they're top 20 in virtually every defensive category, total defense, scoring defense. Um, They've been very, very good in the second half of games over the last four games. You know, I think they've allowed 13 points total. Um, You know, they're allowing uh, less than 130 yards of total offense in the second half of the last four games that they've played. It's, you know, this this defense has really raised the floor of this Alabama, um, you know, team this year. You know, we were talking earlier about Milrow. Like, we're not sure if he could be the guy that could take – this Alabama team all the way to the top, but the defense kind of allows for maybe a little bit more margin for error than we thought when the season began, man, they've been, they've been very, very good. All right, Cody, real quick. We'll get you out of here with this. How do you see things playing out on Saturday? And if you got a score uh, prediction, know, we'll take it too. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a huge Vegas guy, but when I saw 19 and a half is the difference, I, 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 in my head, I'm thinking, you know, 30 to 10 probably sounds about right. I mean, there's there's still talent on that Arkansas team, man. I really like K.J. Jefferson. I think the defense is is a very physical, talented unit. I think they're, they're good enough to probably give Alabama, you know, some problems maybe for a quarter or two or maybe, you know, three, four, five drives if they're able to string some things together. But, you know, I, I'm a believer in this Alabama defense. I think Milrow is, is really starting to hit his stride here. Um, you know, so I think I think 30 to 10 Alabama probably sounds about right. I'm sure your listeners probably won't appreciate that. But, um, you know, this is a really good Alabama team. And, and you know, I think Arkansas just they're running into um, a team that's riding really, really high um, after getting the win in College Station last weekend. So uh, I think it'll be interesting. But I, I think Alabama ultimately pulls away. All right, Cody. Well, we really appreciate having you on and uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Sounds good, Trey. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. All right, everybody. That's Cody Goodwin. Again, you can follow him at Cody Goodwin 24-7. Bama 24-7. Or excuse me, just Cody Goodwin, no 24-7 at the end. But Bama 24-7 staff writer and uh, is a newer guy over there. And obviously, as you can see, um, you got to have you got to be pretty good to cover Alabama in this network, and he does a great job for us over at the Bama site. All right, we're going to flip it over to Curtis Wilkerson now. You guys are more familiar with Curtis, been with us for a few years and does a great job covering everything about Razorback football, basketball, and uh, just does a little bit of everything for us. Curtis, how's it going, man? Oh, man, it's going good. I can't complain. Can't complain. Hey, first you got a little bit of news on um, Trevon Brazil that you can share with us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, pretty cool. You know, Arkansas held its its annual pro day yesterday. There were 23 NBA scouts in attendance at practice. They went through, um, you know, a lot of drills, uh, you know, in front of the scouts to showcase some stuff. But they also did some live five-on-five scrimmaging. And, and I'm told Trevor Brazil uh, participated in that fully, no brace on that knee. I uh, was also told that he was the clear standout of the day. And so I think that's probably music to the ears of Razorback fans. You yeah. know, we'll see – 
if or, or how much they use him in these exhibition games. But, I mean, he's very much on track to be ready to roll on opening night. And I think the more live team stuff he's doing between now and then, the better the on-floor chemistry is going to be with the team. So, um, you know, he had been doing a little bit of three-on-three stuff, you know, leading up to the red-white game. Obviously didn't play, so people were wondering, man, what's going on? Uh, hey, he was he was live in front of NBA scouts yesterday. So I think that's a really good sign. Curtis Wilkerson joining us again. You can follow him at Kurt Wilkerson underscore. He's the Hog Sports Senior Analyst. Curtis, we always ask you keys to victory. Obviously, it's going to be a tough, tough one with this to, to get the victories. <laughs> but for the penalty, for the the keys, always say the same: penalties, turnovers, special teams, injuries. We've discussed a good bit of of that today already. Um, but I love your fifth key in this one because it couldn't be more true. A little luck. Yeah, for sure. I mean, maybe I should have said a lot of luck in, in this case, but no, it, it is the bonus key that I've, I think I've gone with it every year, you know, for this Alabama game. I, I mean, listen, they're they're more talented. They're, uh, they're better coached. They're at home. History is on their side. All those things, you know, Arkansas has to play its A game. Uh, they're going to need things to go their way uh, in several different areas. And, and sometimes it just happens, right? I mean, you know, maybe a, a, a call or a whistle goes your way. We probably shouldn't expect that, uh, you know, covering the Razorbacks. But mm-hmm. it could be a number of things, right? A, a tip ball that falls in your hands, a, a fumble that bounces in your direction. Like, where can Arkansas catch a break or two in this game? And, and I think also you can create your own luck at times, right? Which means, you know, you have to be uh, aggressive and have some chances pay off to, to beat a team like Alabama, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we've seen it the last couple of years. Uh, the, the Reed Bauer to Blake Kern trickery a couple years ago, the, the Jake Bates onside kick and recovery last year. I mean, both of those were huge momentum swings that gave Arkansas a chance in the moment in those games. They just weren't able to capitalize in the end. So, you know, whether it's just something going your way that, that happens organically or if you force the issue a little bit, uh, going to take a little bit of luck or, or maybe a lot of bit of luck to get out of Tuscaloosa with a win. Yeah. Curtis, we're uh... – we're expecting the same starting offensive line to be out there. Maybe there's a possibility Devon Manuel plays in this one. Maybe we see Takias Crawford saw him a little bit. What do you think Arkansas uh, can make some strides this week against Alabama? I mean, it's a it's a tough front, kind of a kind of the kind of front that we saw two weeks ago against Texas A and M. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't I don't necessarily have any reason at all to to think that that's going to happen. Uh, but I also don't see a pathway to this offense finding any sort of rhythm without yeah. those guys just just kind of getting better and playing better. I no mean, question. You, know, you tried to you tried to shake things up last week and, and you abandoned ship at the half, so it almost feels like it's a, essentially a, a week wasted of, of practice there. So, you know, like you said, a, a healthy Devin Manuel aside, uh, you know, if you had other guys who could help right now, I, I got to imagine they'd have been on the field. Uh, so if you're not tweaking personnel, then then maybe it's some of your techniques, your schemes. Sam Pittman talked about some of that stuff this week. Uh, you know, maybe you start to get that continuity going with this group. If this is going to be your five, I, I mean, we haven't seen it yet, but maybe it happens. Uh, but just show a pulse, man. I, I mean, chill out with the false starts. It, it's getting absurd. Uh, you know, move the pocket, faster developing plays. Stop pretending like you've never seen movement on a defensive front before. It, it's crazy to me. Uh, but if they start to cut out, you know, cut into those bag breakers a little bit that have been piling up, you know, the negative plays, KJ Jefferson getting his head taken off every other play, uh, just shows some signs of progress. You'd love to see it. But man, like you said, the problem is you're tasked with doing that, you know, on the road against an Alabama defense that, that's flat out nasty. Mm-hmm. So uh, good luck. I, I don't know if this is going to be the week that it happens, but hopefully uh, they make some strides. If they're going to have any chance in this ball game, they're going to have to. Yeah, and Rocket Sanders had a good game against Alabama last year. Obviously, they they lost the game, but uh, if the offensive line didn't get in shape, then we probably can't expect the as you put vintage performances from KJ and Rocket Sanders in this one. Yeah, I, I, here's the thing, Trey. I mean, you, you assign me five burning questions for each game, and yep. you know, like people on the board are commenting, asking now, like, why why does Trey keep making you do this? Like, listen. <laughs> As, as, as the dedicated employee I am, man, like I'm going to deliver every time, but it's yeah. getting harder and harder I know. to come up with five when like nearly everything comes back to this offensive line, right? So it, it's true. Like if, if those guys you don't – do, You don't can just copy and paste from the last week. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have to, man, uh, because, it, you know, if, if it doesn't improve, like, you know, KJ Rocket, those guys can only do so much. But, uh, you know, if there were ever a quarterback that, that was built to overcome, you know, like – like a one Mississippi rush every snap and it's probably KJ Jefferson. And you mentioned it with, with rocket and we know the star power that he brings to the table when he's healthy, when he's right. 
Um, you know, if you can't hand him the ball and get anything done, then, then maybe you can get him involved more in that screen game. He's popped off a couple nice ones in, in the last couple games on that. Um, you, you know, you're just not going to drive it down Alabama's throat the entire game. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's just not going to happen. So you've got to hit some home runs in this one. And, and I think these are your two playmakers who are capable of, you know, making something out of nothing and, and creating some big plays, some explosive plays that this offense has been lacking. They have to be great to give you a chance, and, and even that may not be enough. So uh, hopefully, you know, for the for the Razorbacks' sake, those guys can have uh, have some big-time games. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, on the other side of the ball, Alabama, the offense isn't what we've, we're used to seeing against Alabama. But at the same time, you're like, is this the game that the defense finally starts olaying and letting it, you know, just blow past? Because they've been playing so well. Is this the game where Alabama finally gets back on track? After the BYU game, I just said, like, uh, okay, they get Alabama in week seven. You know, when Alabama was having quarterback issues, that's just enough time for them to get their quarterback situation figured out. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't happen this week and the defense uh, defense continues to, uh, to play strong in this one. Um, yeah, you're, I'm going to go to your your last question here. Will Arkansas find progress within the process? What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, when the basketball team was struggling last season, you know, early on in SEC play, this is something I kept bringing up a lot and, and something that Eric Musselman spoke to. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you might not be ready to win a game, but are you taking steps in the right direction? You know, like where, where are the positives? You know, is Arkansas cleaning some things up? Um, are they getting better, closer, heading in the right direction? I mean, obviously, like, you know, you play to win the game, right? I mean, I, mean, I get it. And, and this team has that attitude going into Tuscaloosa, as they should. But I, let's be realistic here. Like, in, unless you're drinking the Razorback Kool-Aid with, you know, a bunch of extra sugar in it, you know that's probably not a likely outcome on Saturday. But can this team generate enough just positive momentum, you know, at the end of this, it's, it's like the road swing from hell for, for mm-hmm. us to kind of be able to look at the back half of this schedule and realistically think, okay, like this is a much, much lighter schedule. You know what? They might be trending in the right direction a little bit. They can rattle off some wins here. So, you know, it, you know, if Arkansas goes on to Alabama and loses, like I don't – that's not going to change the way I, I feel about anything just because they lost the game. Like I'm – I'm expecting that to happen, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, if they go down there and play better and, and make some strides in an environment like that, uh, just give you a reason for a little bit of optimism as, as you look ahead, you know, to this back stretch, uh, then I think you can consider that, and we're not into moral victories, but you got to feel a little bit better about things. If they go out there and it's the same recor- recurring themes over and over and over that have been biting them, uh, or, or if they look like they've let go of the rope a little bit, then you're concerned about, you know, things a little bit more moving forward. So, um, can you find a little bit of progress while understanding that it's still a process and getting where you need to be? Uh, I, I think that needs to be a goal for this team this weekend. I mean, you think I'm just enjoying writing these behind enemy line stories every week, Curtis? And you know, no, I don't, I don't the, think you are, man. <laughs> <laughs> doing the offense versus defense preview and doing it's on tough. radio shows and talking about how crappy the offensive line is over and over and over again. <laughs> You should just record it and then play it when exactly. you're on the radio. You know? Exactly. All right, Curtis. <laughs> anything else you want to add? Any basketball stuff? I mean, we got eight days till the next exhibition, but anything else you want to add, whether it's football or basketball? Uh, no, not really. Uh, you're right. You know, it's a little quiet right now with, with basketball. They had the pro day stuff. I wish we could go out there and watch that, but I understand, uh, you know, them not wanting guys like me to go play 21 questions with, with NBA scouts while they're trying to evaluate the players. <laughs> sure. So hopefully we can get some more feedback on that. But yeah, I mean, next week, next Friday, I uh, get that first exhibition game. They get to mix it up against somebody else. That'll be a lot of fun. And then, uh, man, the bye week for football hits, and you got that Purdue exhibition. That's going to be crazy. That yeah. might be the the wildest atmosphere for an exhibition that yeah. you'll ever see. So, I'm, when do you have an exhibition? I'm really for that one. When do you have an exhibition like that? I mean, people have talked about playing other, you know, major conference teams in like a quiet, like hidden behind the scenes scrimmage and stuff. But I mean, this is right. basically right in front of everybody. You can tell me they don't care about who wins and loses this one. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's it's going to be nuts. And, it, and you know, Purdue's a really, really good team. They got the seven foot four, you know, center Zach Eady. He's a, the national player yep. of the year coming back. So it's just going to be really, really awesome. And I'm glad that they're opening it up for people to get in there and see. You know, yeah. that's one thing about Eric Musselman. Like he's he's not going to duck it. Like you, I mean, you're going to see what this team is made up early on. They did it against Texas last year. 
uh, they got smacked around. He said he knew that that was coming, that they'd be better for it. And lo and behold, they got, you know, to the tournament and figured some things out and, and won some big games there. So they grew up and got tougher from it. Um, I don't think it's going to be that kind of result against Purdue, uh, but I, I think it's going to tell you a lot about this team, and it's going to be something that they carry with them throughout the course of the season. Yeah, well, great stuff, Curtis, and great news on Trevon Brazil. I mean, how many times have we seen guys come back from an injury? Oh, yeah, they're totally healthy, but they're not the same player that they were before. So uh, good exactly. news to hear that the, the the pro scouts are really liking what they're seeing, and it could be a good matchup for him, you know, whether he plays, um, you know, in the post or, you know, at, at the four uh, against Edie. So. Should be exactly. interesting. All right, brother. Appreciate you. Yep. Anytime. I'll talk to you soon. All right, everybody. That's Kurt Wilkerson. You can follow him at Kurt Wilkerson underscore. Yeah, it goes by Curtis. We call him Kurt. Keep it simple. <laughs> All right. Where should we go? We've got a little time for questions. Before we get to that, if you have questions about internet service, you should check out Ozarks Go. You can reach them at ozarksgo.net slash hog, H A W G. Or you call them at 479-684-4900. Think north of the tunnel in northwest Arkansas, parts of Missouri, Oklahoma. If you get Ozarks Electric, you probably have access to Ozarks Go. They are ever-expanding. Great internet service. A couple guys came over, hooked everything up, in and out. Very nice. Everything has worked since. I use multi-gig, which is 2,500 megabits per second internet speed, and it is lightning quick, like instantaneous. And uh, before that, I had uh, gigabit, which is 1,000 megabits per second. Also, I think that would work for most families. They offer several different tiers, but you can find out more. It's a local company, so when you call them at 479-684-4900, you're going to talk to somebody from around here who knows the region, who knows what you're talking about, not somebody in a call center or something like that. So if you're curious, if you're disappointed, I know I've been disappointed. I've used just about everybody up here and have had problems with every single one of them. I just haven't had problems with Ozarks Go. I'm not sure if that'll be your experience, but that's my experience. So I put my stamp of approval on Ozarks Go. Again, reach them at ozarksgo.net slash hog. And Matt, I saw your funny fantasy team name. I think you're funny. All right. Let's see if we got a couple questions here. Only good questions today. Don Dunn says, Don Dunn says, we have talent on the team. I believe that they will compete in the game. They will compete. They will play, put a complete game together at some point, obviously, the sooner the better. Yeah, I mean, if they did it this weekend, that would be fantastic. John Douglas says, why isn't Criswell given a chance? Can we really be 100% sure most of the problem is – no, it's not all just the offensive line. I think you make a good point. KJ has, without question, made some really poor decisions. Without question, he has. I also think it's probably in his head a little bit. I don't know that Criswell is necessarily the answer. If you can't block, then you're not going to have good good quarterback play. I was talking with Greg McElroy this morning. I was on his show, um, and we were talking about that exact same thing. If you can't get protection, it doesn't matter who is in there at quarterback. So I don't know that, like, benching your starting three-year starter quarterback who's been a stud for you for, you know, a long time um, in favor of a guy who hasn't really played that much. Not that I don't think Criswell has a ton of ability, because I do. I really like his arm. But I don't know if that's the answer necessarily, benching the quarterback. You know, I don't know if that's – the solution with this team. Bill Richards says, we're all disappointed, but we knew it would be a tough win. Any of those games in the four game stretch on the road, go Hawks. Yeah. That's what makes the, the BYU game stand out a lot to me. It's just like, I mean, you got to win that game. And I know BYU, what is BYU's record right now? I think they just lost to Kansas, right? BYU is, Four and one right now. They have beaten Sam Houston, Southern Utah, Arkansas. They lost by 11 to Kansas. They beat Cincinnati, and they play TCU this week. So it's possible BYU's just got a good team, but still, it's in it's in Fayetteville. It's at home, and the stretch that you have coming up, there's just no reason. And this is a team you and, – and every year's different as we're seeing. But this is a team that uh, they, you know, took care of pretty handily last year so that was that's the big disappointing 
in this season. And it seems like Arkansas gives you one every year. It seems like they're going to take, they're going to lose one, they shouldn't, and win one, they should. And when you look back on the season, you're like, ah, oh, if they just hadn't have lost that one, maybe it would have been nine, ten wins, something like that. Dalton Adams says you can be both thankful for Sam and what he's done for the program, but also critical of his lack of development and recognize he won't be the one that pushes the program to the next level. I absolutely think that there's uh, a camp that feels exactly like that, Dalton. I don't think you're alone in that sentiment. Um, Scott Hickman says, I was basically thinking eight and four, nine and three. I think a lot of position groups were going to get better, especially the defense, but I sure didn't expect the offensive line to be so bad. Neither did I. And we don't get to watch scrimmages and stuff. Like it was like I go out and watch players, like, man, these guys look pretty good. And I stand by that. They look, they've got some players now. I think losing Sam Bakke at wide receiver has hurt them also because I think he was going to be a real, like maybe a surprise type player for them this year. Uh, so losing him really stunk. He was making plays every single day in practice, like big plays. Uh, so I think that hurt them a little bit at wide receiver. But when I look at the group as a whole, and especially the defense, they shored stuff up. And here's the thing that stinks. Like, they recognized the issues on defense, and they went out and addressed them. And they have put together a pretty solid defense overall. I mean, at worst, this is an average SEC defense, a defense after being the worst defense in the SEC last year. This isn't at least an average SEC defense, which is pretty good. You play most teams out of conference with an average SEC defense, you're going you're gonna to put something on somebody. But why didn't they recognize the offensive line deficiencies? And that whole thing is screwed up because you can't block on the offensive line. Like, you screw up the whole offense. It doesn't matter who you have at quarterback or at wide receiver or at running back. I mean, you're talking about a preseason All-SEC quarterback, a first-team All-SEC running back last year, every back returning from last year, plus Dominic Johnson's healthier. They did some good work in the transfer portal at wide receiver. Hurt losing Bakke, but Andrew Armstrong's been a stud. I think Isaac Tesla has underperformed based on what we saw. I mean, Isaac Tesla, everybody talks about he can't get separation and, you know, he has this problem. I look on film and I see him open a lot of times. And I know what his testing numbers are. I know that he can run and he can jump. I mean, like – his testing numbers, like if you want to combine everything, like his are pretty elite. His strength number, his jumping number, his speed numbers, they're all pretty elite. But he's not getting open. And I guess that's where somebody's going to chime in and say, oh, there's a difference in football speed and track speed and all that stuff. And maybe that's true. But um, I still think that they have, have good weapons. And, and losing Luke has in the passing game is also, you know, that's been pretty devastating. And taking a while to figure out Tyrus Washington is – a better option at tight end than some of the guys that they've been throwing out there who can't block or catch. Zach Van says, everybody knew this four-game stretch. Oh, we just read that one. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, everybody knew the four-game stretch was going to be difficult. And all anybody was really asking was, take care of BYU at home and get one of these on the road. Not, not, not four on the road, one. One and three. That's what I had it projected at. Go one and three during this stretch. One and three. And I even said, like, if they, if this is a team that, you know, obviously expecting them to beat BYU as I projected, but I was like, if they go two and two during this four-game stretch, and then this is like a 10-win caliber team. Obviously, that hasn't happened. They're not a 10-win caliber team. It's not even possible now. But, yeah, all anybody was saying was one. I mean, they're underdogs in every one of these games. You know, they're all road games against quality teams, LSU, Texas A&M, Alabama, Ole Miss. Nobody's saying, like, win them all. Get one of them. And they were, they've been close. They've been close in two of them. Bill Davis says, where's A.J. Green been? Hardly a chance in the long run weeks back. Um, yeah, you know, A.J. gives them home run hitting ability. I, I think what – they like about Dominion and Rocket, obviously, uh, is those guys hit the hole a little harder. Um, but that hasn't – I mean, they've just been running to a brick wall. <laughs> so, why not get some speed out there? I get it. And it's like Dominion hadn't been setting the world on fire in pass pro either. Dalton Adams says, Green excels in space and in quick plays. Danny O's office combined with our lack of an offense line doesn't allow for much opportunity for him. Bill Davis says too many slow developing plays. That has absolutely been a problem. And you, I mean, you also have to think like with Enos, maybe he's finally getting, you know, 
figuring out what his team does because it hasn't all just been on the offensive line. KJ's made some terrible decisions. Uh, the running backs have also struggled in pass protection and, and not hitting holes also. We've seen that all year. Uh, tight ends have struggled blocking, especially with Lucas out. Uh, you know, I think it's going to get better with Ty Washington. But it's not all just on the offensive line. And, you know, and a lot of it's on Eno. Some of the plays that he calls are just – you're just asking a lot on some of these offensive linemen to make some, some of these blocks. So, you know, I mean – Here's the deal, too. Like, you know, people talk about whether Sam Pittman should be retained or not and that stuff. He fixed the defense. Um, he's got to fix the offense this offseason if, if he's retained. And, um, you know, there's still a lot of football to play, as I, you know, talked about at the top of the show and all that. I'm not going to go back into all that stuff. But he's got to fix the offense. There will be staff changes. There's no question about that. There's going to be – like, he's done it every single year. And last year was a lot, too. But there will be staff changes. And he's got to address, you know, some changes on the staff and um, getting the right players out of the portal for immediate impact. And that could include the offensive line. Now, you're going to have some other guys that are, you know, going to get older and they'll be better than they were this year. But um, you got to make sure that you can protect your quarterback. There's no question about that. Norman Hunt says, I'm going to say Bama wins 24-17. I mean, if they if they go to Tuscaloosa and lose 24-17, I mean, I know moral victories and all that stuff, but there's just not a lot of shame in that for me. Like, I'm not – I mean, they're a 19.5-point underdog. If Arkansas goes out there and loses 24-17, you're not going to – I'm not going to be happy, but you're not going to see me ticked off on a walk and talk after the game. You, you're just not. I mean, I'm not going to be happy, but – unless they do something like stupid, like false start at the goal line and it causes them to lose the game or something like that, then maybe. You know, I guess there's a lot of different ways that could go. Norman Hunt says, if Arkansas pulls the upset, does that save Coach Pittman's job? I mean, not if they just crumble the rest of the way. You know, it's not. It's just one game, but, yeah. Stop acting like you've never seen movement up front. Curtis, keep it real. Wilkerson, LOL, uh, from Kingsley. Yeah, I – the false starts have been just infuriating this year. It's It cost them. It cost them against BYU. It cost them the game. Um, well, I mean, there's other reasons that, that cost them the game, poor offensive line play in general. But um, it really cost them that game. And, uh, you know, it cost them against LSU in a big way. It didn't cost them against Texas A&M because they didn't have any penalties, which was ridiculous because I saw several times they should have been called for penalties. I saw times when Texas A&M should have been called for penalties. Those refs were terrible in that game. Um, it cost them last weekend against Alabama. Let's see what else we got. Anything? Anything outside of the realm of what we've been discussing? Had I had our Ed O to run the offense? <laughs> Y'all, 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 football. Uh, I think we're pretty good. I think we've covered it. Hey, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, go ahead and do it real quick. Just before you turn off the show, just do it. Subscribe. YouTube. Right now. Just take a moment. You've been meaning to do it. You're just like, oh, I keep forgetting to do that. Trey says do that every time, but I start watching the show and I forget. Just subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just take a moment. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. If you like the show, just just do it real quick. Show your pappy the show. Your pappy, he doesn't know how to use the internet. He doesn't, he doesn't have an iPhone. He has an old flip phone or a rotary phone, and he doesn't know about the show. He's just sitting there, and he loves the Razorbacks, and he doesn't even know this is out there. Just go give him your phone and say, hey, Pappy, watch Trey's show. Listen to what he has to say. It's very popular. I think you'll like it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. We're going to exit on a whisper count, I guess. I don't know why I'm whispering, but I am. Because it makes things more dramatic when you talk in a whisper. All right. Thanks to Curtis Wilkerson. Thanks to Cody Goodwin. And thanks to all of you for joining us on Hog Sports Live. And I'll be back with you for the walk and talk on Saturday. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. This has been Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, and we'll catch you next time. 